This is the third and final part of a series on distal upper limb blocks. In the previous videos, we discussed applied anatomy and blocks at the mid-humeral and anti-cubital level. In this video, we focus on blocks at the mid-forearm level and how to apply these blocks to provide motor sparing surgical anesthesia of the hand. Surgical anesthesia or analgesia of the hand may be provided by mid-forearm blocks of the median nerve, ulnar nerve, and superficial radial nerve. These nerves are generally simple to locate and identify on ultrasound. They have predictable relationships to muscles and vessels in the forearm and are readily visualized. Blockade of the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve is also recommended as it often innervates the first dorsal web space. Note that the median and ulnar nerves do not innervate any structures proximal to the wrist crease, and thus blocks of the other antibrachial nerves may also be needed if the incision extends proximal to the hand. Let's start with the mid-forearm median nerve block. Position the patient's arm supinated at the elbow to expose the ventral surface of the forearm and place the probe in a transverse orientation on the fleshy ventral part of the mid-forearm. At this location, the median nerve is always sandwiched between the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus muscles. The nerve can be anisotropic, so tilt the probe back and forth as needed to light it up. The median nerve may be traced into the distal wrist beyond the innervation of the muscle bellies of flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus by its anterior interosseous branch. The main advantage of blocking it in this more distal location is to ensure that there is motor sparing of the forearm flexor muscles. The nerve may be blocked using an in-plane or out-of-plane approach, advancing the needle tip at a tangent to its surface to avoid piercing it. Inject into the fascial sheath that surrounds the nerve. Five to eight milliliters of local anesthetic is sufficient. In this video, the median nerve is targeted at a more distal location. More experienced practitioners can use a single operator technique with a 25 gauge hypodermic needle. Again, the aim is to inject within the fascial sheath with minimal needle nerve contact. Needle repositioning is not usually needed if local anesthetic is spreading within the sheath. With the arm in the same supinated position, the ulnar nerve is most easily identified by placing the probe close to the wrist crease over the ulnar artery. The ulnar nerve is always located immediately adjacent and medial to the artery. Both nerve and artery can be traced proximally to the upper forearm where they separate from each other. The nerve may be blocked anywhere in the lower half of the forearm as long as it is proximal to the takeoff of the dorsal cutaneous branch and the palmar cutaneous branch. The dorsal cutaneous branch runs under flexi carpi ulnaris tendon and winds around the bony ulna to innervate the dorsum of the medial hand and the fourth and fifth digits. On this dynamic back and forth ultrasound scan, the dorsal branch can be seen separating from the ulnar nerve on ultrasound close to the proximal wrist crease. As with the median nerve, a more distal injection site may be chosen if complete motor sparing of flexor carpi ulnaris and digitorum profundus is desired. An in-plane or out-of-plane approach can again be used depending on what is ergonomically most feasible. Advance the needle tip at a tangent to its surface to avoid piercing it. 
and inject into the fascial sheath to surround the nerve. Once again, 5 to 8 milliliters of local anesthetic is sufficient. In this video, the ulnar nerve is targeted at a more distal location where it is lying adjacent to the artery. Once again, more experienced practitioners can use a single operator technique with a 25 gauge hypodermic needle. Once the needle tip is within the fascial envelope surrounding the nerve, further needle tip manipulation is generally unnecessary. As was discussed in part two of this video series, the radial nerve can be blocked at the mid-humeral area, as shown here. If motor sparing of the extensor forearm muscles is desired, however, the superficial radial nerve must be selectively blocked while avoiding blockade of the deep branch and posterior interosseous nerve. The superficial radial nerve runs under the brachioradialis muscle and in the distal half of the forearm is just lateral to the radial artery, which also lies under brachioradialis. It emerges into the subcutaneous tissues at the anatomical snuff box, close to the cephalic vein. With the forearm in the supinated or mid-pronated position, the probe is placed over the lateral surface of the forearm. At the elbow joint, the radial nerve is an elongated structure under the brachioradialis muscle. As the probe is slid distally, the radial nerve continues under the muscle and splits into its superficial and deep branches, with the deep branch traveling off in a posterior lateral direction to innervate muscles. As the probe is slid more distally towards the wrist, the brachioradialis muscle shrinks into its tendon and the superficial radial nerve becomes gradually more and more superficial, running just lateral to the radial artery until it lies just under the investing fascia. Note that the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, the terminal branch of the musculocutaneous nerve, lies in the same area and can be seen here in the subcutaneous tissues just above the superficial radial nerve. Beyond the anatomical snuff box, the superficial radial nerve pierces the investing fascia to become subcutaneous, while the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve dissipates into its terminal branches. The superficial radial nerve may be blocked anywhere along its course under brachioradialis muscle. Another simple alternative is subcutaneous infiltration over the posterior lateral wrist, just proximal to the anatomical snuff box. Doing this under ultrasound guidance helps ensure injection in the correct subcutaneous plane above the investing fascia and under the dermis. The nerves often become visible as local anesthetic spreads around them. The infiltration technique has the added advantage of anesthetizing the terminal branches of the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which often contributes to innovation of the dorsal first web space and base of thumb, as well as terminal branches of the posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve. In this final section, I will describe how to apply these approaches to provide motor sparing surgical anesthesia of the hand. 
This is a specialized indication for certain surgical repairs that benefit from intraoperative testing of range of movement of the fingers. Keep pulling. Note that a forearm tourniquet works best as this is associated with less discomfort than an upper arm tourniquet and is better tolerated by the patient. This technique obviously also requires a cooperative patient who is willing to forego sedation. To achieve the necessary operating conditions, the nerves that must be blocked are the superficial radial nerve, the median nerve, and the ulnar nerve, while at the same time making sure to avoid blocking the branches that supply the flexor and extensor muscles of the forearm. Depending on the extent of surgery, it may also be necessary to block the antibrachial cutaneous nerves, which can innervate the skin over the wrist. The recommended blocks are therefore as follows. A mid-forearm median nerve block distal to the belly of flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. A mid-forearm ulnar nerve block distal to the belly of flexor digitorum profundus but proximal to the takeoff of the cutaneous branches. And a superficial radial nerve block. This last one can be most efficiently done by a subcutaneous infiltration over the posterior lateral wrist, which will also cover the antibrachial cutaneous nerves. Note that the antibrachial cutaneous nerves can also be targeted individually, as discussed elsewhere in this series of videos. This concludes the series on distal upper limb blocks. Thank you for watching, and please check out the other videos on ultrasound guided regional anesthesia in this channel.